Thank you, Bob. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to the Old Testament book of Joel? Uh, we're going to begin reading in chapter 2, verse 18, and we'll read through verse 27 in just a few moments. If you're with us and have not been here the past three weeks, we've been looking at this three-chapter book and taking our time going through it. Um, so we're very excited to study God's Word uh, this morning. You know, I think about not just Joel, but other Old Testament figures and persons, and I can't help but think of Queen Esther. Her story is very interesting. In fact, the book of Esther is interesting in that all of the books of the Bible, Esther is the one book, I understand, that does not mention God's name specifically. But as you study Esther, you see God's sovereign hand working throughout it. You may remember what happened in Esther's day uh, uh, when the people were freed to go back into uh, the promised land after the exile. Not everyone went, and so uh, God's people were dispersed in various parts of the earth. The Persian kingdom, the Medo-Persian empire overthrew the Babylonian empire, and some people were absorbed into uh, that particular area, enter Queen Esther. Queen Esther was strategically placed in biblical history, and at that particular time, the Jews were a despised people. And there was a particular man named Haman that especially despised the Jews because he detested Esther's older relative, Mordecai. And so he looked for an opportunity to have the Jewish people destroyed. He even built a gallows hoping uh, that Mordecai himself would be killed through that. And very interestingly, what Haman built actually came back on himself. But things really turned through this person, Esther. You may have heard that saying, Mordecai, for such a time as this. In other words, he says, uh, you know, if you don't do it, God may deliver in some other way, but this is your time. And so Esther, who was naturally beautiful, um, was among a number of uh, Ahasuerus, the emperor's harem, and it was determined that things were so desperate that she needed to appeal uh, to the emperor. And you just didn't knock on the door on a Monday morning and walk into the king's presence. You, it was a fearful thing. You might be accepted, you might not, but there was one thing you would look for, and that would be the golden scepter. And if you appeared somewhere near and it was extended out, then that meant you had the emperor or the king's favor and could come into his presence. Well, she was granted that. Uh, she uh, had a plan to have a, a feast, and basically throughout all of that, God brought judgment against the people who were against the Jews, brought favor to the Jews, and the Feast of Purim, of Purim rather, is recognized by Jews even today as God's deliverance. You know, for Esther and the people, that golden scepter was so critical because it represented favor, it represented uh, acceptance. And I thought about God as I was thinking about this event in Esther's life. What would it be to receive the golden scepter of God, to know that you have the favor of God, that a people would have the favor of God? And I believe we see it here in our text this morning. We, we see the results of the blessing of being favored by God. So we're going to see today that the people move from blight to delight. They move from a ravaged land that would be a fruitful land. Things would move from being fruitless to fruitful. Fear would give way to favor. And these course of events would change uh, everything for them. And we're going to see what leads to that uh, today. But look with me at Joel chapter 2. In verse 18, then the Lord became jealous for his land and spared his people. The Lord answered his people, look, I am about to send you grain, new wine, and fresh oil. You will be satiated with them, and I will no longer make you a disgrace among the nations. I will drive the northerner far from you and banish him to a dry and desolate lands, his front ranks into the Dead Sea, and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. His stench will rise. Yes, his rotten smell will rise, for he has done astonishing things. 
Don't be afraid, land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, wild animals, for the wilderness pastures have turned green. The trees bear their fruit, and the fig tree and grapevine yield their riches. Children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God, because he gives you the autumn rain for your vindication. He sends showers for you, both autumn and spring rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will overflow with new wine and fresh oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts ate, the young locusts, the destroying locusts, locusts, and the devouring locusts, my great army that I sent against you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. My people will never again be put to shame. You will know that I am present in Israel and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people will never again be put to shame. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we thank you for it, and we thank you, Lord, that you're the same God today that you were then. You're a mighty God, as we saw last week, a God full of compassion and grace and mercy and long-suffering. Father, but a God who is demanding, and Father, when we sin, when we are in the cycle of sin or under the throes of sin, you call us to be honest with ourselves and you call us, Lord, to repent. And repenting, Lord, being not just our change of mind, but our change of actions that are motivated by the convicting work of your spirit. And so, Lord, we pray today for our nation as we read about a nation here. We pray also for our individual selves and we lift this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. You know, again, today we're looking at the book of Joel. We saw in the first chapter how God had control or has control all, over all of nature. We saw this great army of literal locusts that would ravage the land and did ravage the land. Then as we looked in chapter 2, uh, Joel takes us farther into the future. I believe even our future as it speaks about the day of the Lord when God would intervene and will intervene in all of history. We saw all of the uh, devastating and amazing things that would happen in that. Yet right after sharing about the uh, greatness of God, we saw last week the good Goodness of God, how God is by nature a merciful God. He's gracious, He's compassionate, He's slow to anger. But last week, as we looked at the qualities of God, um, as God was describing Himself through the prophet, He was also calling the people to repent, to repent. And we understand today that the key really to God's favor for a nation is repentance. But the same thing is true for a nation is true for us. And so we see all of this playing out. And today I want to look at God's favor. We can easily say that. Three syllables, two words, God's favor. It's easy said, but what does it really mean to, expect, to, to experience that favor? What does it mean to bring that favor from God to us? Why do so many people miss God's favor. They may live their entire lives, long seasons of lives, and really miss the blessing, the favor of God. And in verse 27, it talks about, you know that I am present in Israel, the favor of his presence. And so today, in the midst of all this that is happening, we see that God speaks words of favor to his people. We need that word today. Because we're going through a season of chaos, not only in our nation, around the world, and we see so much discord, so much disorder, so much hatred. And as we look at that, we begin to thank God, grant us as a nation your favor. And so this morning, we're going to look at a particular emotion of God. I think it's important that we study it. It's in the first verse. And then as we move from that, we're going to see what we will find to be his response to the repentance of his people. And finally, we're going to see the ultimate goal of all of this, which is really God's glory, God's glory. And so as we look at that word favor, I looked at Merriam-Webster's definition. It is approving consideration or attention. It might also be called partiality. I'm the middle of three children. There, I have an older brother and a younger sister. And it was tough following 
my older brother in school because from a young age, he was a natural leader. I wasn't. And I can remember I was in the Latin club and somebody who was a year older than I wanted to be the Latin club president. And I was a little sophomore and my brother came. He was a senior. He said, do you want to be president? And I said, well, that girl's already doing it. He said, I'll be your campaign manager. I ended up being the Latin club president. My brother is, just has natural leadership. He's, he's very humble, I think. Um, and, but uh, it was tough following him in school. I can remember I had Miss Waldron in 12th grade, and she told me, she said, you're no John. Well, you're not going to get much out of a student when you tell them uh, that, that they're not up to the par of, of their older brother. But my brother had favor with teachers. In a way, it did make it easy because at least my teachers expected something. But he had that favor, that approving consideration. When his name was mentioned, it brought good thoughts. Now, God says of Israel that he loved that nation, that he loves that nation. He says to his people in Zechariah 2.8, those who touch Israel touch the apple of my eye or we might more accurately say the pupil of my eye. It speaks to God's intimate relationship with this nation in the old covenant at days. And so we understand that Israel was a, 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 a faultful nation. It was a nation that had many problems. There was idolatry. There was mistreatment of the poor. There were all of these things that were going on within the nation of Israel, yet God still loved that nation. And that's encouraging to us today, as Daniel was sharing in the Sunday school hour, that God can use us. God can use us in our brokenness. That continuum that he shared is a picture of God's redemption. And wherever we find ourselves as a nation or people historically or where we're going, God is still working toward that end. He, he does take delight when his children act like children. And, and that's why I believe we're, we're going to see today these wonderful blessings of God, I believe, were contingent upon his people responding in obedience to him. In other words, if you want to live a blessed life, the blessed life is to obey God in whatever he's calling you to do. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate to everything going easy. Sometimes it may be even more difficulty following God. But there is the blessing of knowing that you have the favor of God, that no matter what man does to you, no matter what happens in your life, illness, whatever, you can have the favor of God. And so today I want to note three things. The first thing <clears throat> is the emotion showed by God. And we see that in verse 18 where it says, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and spared his people. Then um, it leads us back to all of this that has happened, all the judgment of him describing himself through the prophet as being compassionate, of loving, merciful, and long-suffering. But all of this was that God really cared about the people. Last week we saw all of those wonderful attributes, but we would add today that the Lord is a jealous God and also a, a zealous God for us. Now, jealousy can <clears throat> be a bad thing. It can be very bad. Uh, in fact, often as it presents itself, it can lead to, to terrible, terrible circumstances. Jealousy can be bad. I think of Joseph's brothers who were jealous. The position in favor they wanted from the father, their father, uh, Joseph received. And so we see what happened. They sold him into slavery. It led to difficulty in Joseph's life. It led to years where their father grieved. And then it led even to them being judged in fearful jealousy led in a, a bad way. And then we see in the New Testament, Elimus, that sorcerer, who was really jealous over uh, Paul and Barnabas and, and the influence that they had. You could see he was sort of the show of the town. And then when they come in, he was jealous. And, and his jealousy actually led to the delayed conversion of an individual and led to temporary blindness for him. Jealousy can be bad. In fact, sometimes it can be very bad when it's issued in a a selfish way, in an, um, an unrighteous way towards someone or something that can lead us to worry when that person's just living his or her life to conjecture or even considering harm. But I appeal to you today that that's not the jealousy of God here. 
God is without sin. Here God's jealousy is accompanied by a great zeal for his people. And jealousy communicates value. Uh, you know, now, uh, I, I can be jealous uh, even toward my wife sometimes. I try not to be over it, but it's because she matters to me. Um, the famed Christian count, and she doesn't ever give me reason to be jealous. I'm just being honest, you know. The, the famed Christian counselor, James Dobson, was once leading a counseling session for a husband and a wife, and it had been a number of meetings. They had gone on for a few weeks. And as the, the couple was talking with Dr. Dobson, the wife got to a point. He asked her, Dr. Dobson, what do you think? She says, you know, I'm really good with all of this. I've, I've sort of settled it, and it's all good. It, what's happened's happened. It doesn't bother me. Then Dr. Dobson realized we got a problem here because it no longer mattered to her. She was indifferent toward her husband. See, the opposite of jealousy in the context here would be indifference. And so isn't it a beautiful thing to know that in, in, in spite of all of the failings of this nation, that God still cared about them, that they mattered. And isn't it good to know that that can translate to us, that even if we've been imperfect, even if we've done things that aren't right with God, God can still love us, and he does. In Isaiah chapter 5, God gives a picture of his love for his people, of a vineyard. And, and this vineyard owner who, who took great care to build around and protect that vineyard, to cultivate, to plant, to cultivate everything, expecting a great harvest, yet the vineyard itself was fruitless. And he describes his anger over the matter. Because why was he angry? Because he had invested so much in his people, and that, that vineyard is a picture of the people of God, uh, of the Jews. He had invested so much in them, yet to them, they were idolaters. God has an amazing love for us. He cares about us. He cares about you, what you're going through right now. And these emotions that we've seen over the past couple of weeks, jealousy, long-suffering, mercy, um, grace, and compassion, all of these things come together to give us a picture of a God who's not only great, who's able to do amazing things, but who's good, who cares about his people. And so we see that emotion. Well, I want you to move with me in verses 19 through 26. We see this restoration that is affected by God. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, it's been some rough things to read. There's been some judgment. There's been devastation. All of the created order of that time, the, the plant life, the vegetation, the animals, the people, everything was suffering. And it just seems one thing was piling on the other. But we see even as happened in that case with uh, Esther in, in the days of Ahasuerus, that things turned, that things pivoted. And so in a matter of a couple of chapters, we see that fruitlessness becomes fruitfulness, that fear is led to favor. And we see the amazing restoration by God an amazing picture of not just bringing back the vegetation, bringing back the animals, bringing back the people, but bringing to a level that would never be expected. That's very important. We don't know, again, the exact date of Joel. We don't have enough information. I so much appreciate Daniel and what he shares in Sunday school because we do need to have some idea. I think we can know for certain uh, this was after the United Kingdom, and we can be pretty sure it was before the exile. We know that God is working here. But, but as we look at it, we see that he is picturing restoration of his people, but it was contingent upon the people's repentance. 
Think about this, the father of the prodigal son, he loved that son, but until the son came to his senses and realized that he had done wrong and realized his sin against his father and, and repented and came back, only through that was the father showing that favor. He had that love, but as long as the son was living the way that he was living, he couldn't have experienced it. And so as we look at it, I believe implicit in this favor is a picture of a time, whatever that might be, of the people repenting and turning to God. Well, you say, well, Rick, that means it's all contingent on me. No, it's not. It's contingent on God. Because it's God's spirit who convicts a person. It's God's spirit who convicts a nation. Repentance is just our response to God in his grace and mercy continuing to extend out. Remember when we studied in Jeremiah a few weeks ago, the people were rejecting, rejecting Jeremiah's message for so many years. And then right before the judgment was going to come, God still sent them out a, raft, uh, a, a lifeline, sent them out a raft and said, hey, if you'll repent even now, you'll go into captivity still, but, but you'll be spared. You, you'll, you'll have my favor. And so as we think about the favor of God, we should be driven to repent of sin. I think back uh, right after the uh, temple in Solomon's day was established, it said this familiar por portion, we become sometimes so familiar with, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and do what? Turn from their evil ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin. Was that it? No. And heal their land. What we see here in verses 19 through 26 is a healing of all of that known created order. We see even the wild animals, the vegetation, the people, they were going to be blessed and benefited. And this is important to know. Repentance leads to restoration. Now, God is the one who convicts us. And sometimes God will convict us and we'll be like those people in Jeremiah's day. We'll just kick the can down the road and say it's all going to be all right at the end. If we're not careful, it's going to be as Bob just saying. But God's grace and mercy and the work of his Holy Spirit leads us, the entire, the, the goal of that is to lead us to repentance, which would be restoration, which ultimately we're going to see is God's glory. Do you want to glorify God in your life? Then live a life that is in obedience to the Lord. If there's unconfessed sin in your life or something that's characteristic of your life that you know is not right with God, there's one response, and that is to repent. And so God initiates, he convicts when we're off course. And then as we repent, God blesses. And so we see two aspects of that blessing here in these verses. First, in verse um, 20, is his protection. He said, I'll drive the northerner far from you and banish him to a dry and desolate land, his front ranks into the Dead Sea and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. His stench will rise, yes, his rotten smell will rise, for he has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done astonishing things. This is God's protection. We've already seen this nature invasion of locusts. We've seen described what would be the, the, the army, a literal army that would come. And we know the Assyrian army did that. Again, I appreciate, I've, I've enjoyed uh, Daniel's study. He brought out a great point. As we look at uh, verse uh, 20 here, I'll drive the northern or far from you. Really, other than Egypt, the passageway for Assyria, Babylon, even Greece was from the north. We understand like Assyria and Babylon, uh, there was a vast desert land and so they had to travel, as he said, sort of loop around and come. So we see that here. He says, I'll drive the northerner far from you. But notice what he does. He says his front ranks into the Dead Sea and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Mediterranean Sea was the west. The Dead Sea was to the east and the south. And so it leads us to think that he's not speaking literally of a natural locust invasion, but a real army. Because usually if locusts are swept, the wind's going to go one direction, and they're going to be wiped out in one. But God is going to work in a powerful way with this northern army, and he's going to defeat them. And basically, he's going to protect, protect the promised land protect his people. 
God worked so many miracles in the Old Testament. Think of the times that God brought victory when man did nothing. Think of Gideon taking 300 men and defeating a, a vast army multiple times more. Uh, think of the, the days in Jehoshaphat when all Jehoshaphat did was lead a, a congregation in singing and the armies turned against themselves. But I also think about in Isaiah 37, the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king. He knew how wicked Assyria was. He, he understood the reputation, the power uh, of this kingdom. He understood uh, what happened to the northern kingdom and to Aram or Damascus and all of that. And so the Assyrians camped around the city. And a letter was sent to him, threatening from Sennacherib. And, and, and King Hezekiah just took it out and laid it on the ground and laid himself on the ground before the Lord. And what did God do? He defeated 185,000 of the Assyrian army without the, the Jewish people having to lift one arm. They turned against themselves. It talks here about the stench. Can you imagine the stench of 185,000 people uh, that died? Well, I want you to see secondly, his provision. Uh, there are more uh, verses that address his provision even than his protection. He was going to restore the land's fruitfulness. Verse 20, grain, new wine, fresh oil. Uh, the early rains and the latter rains would return. And, and so they would need uh, the rains at the right season in order uh, for the land to be fruitful. And God was going to make the fruitfulness of the land again. All the land that had been ravaged would be fully replenished. He would consequently restore the animal life. Look at uh, verse 22. Don't be afraid wild animals, not domesticated animals. Now think about it. Uh, the domesticated animals would probably be first in line because the people who had thought processes would want to protect their investment. But he's saying not only will the domesticated animals be provided for, but even the wild animals. And then he says God's people would be blessed, that God would provide. I will repay you, verse 25, for the years the swarming locust ate. Verse 26, you will have plenty to eat. They would go from a time of dearth to a time of abundance. And when God grants his favor, blessings abound. Now, I'm not preaching a health and wealth gospel here because that's a false gospel that a lot of people try to use to get a lot of money to make people follow them. I'm saying that when we repent and that when we obey, that there is the favor of God upon us. And no matter what happens to us externally, Nothing can compare to that favor. Well, I want you to see the ultimate result of God's favor in verses 26 and 27. You know, the Westminster Short Catechism, uh, written in the mid-1600s, there are about 107 questions that were asked. The very first answer to the very first question is this. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You've probably heard that. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to honor him forever. Do you ever th stop and think about that? The, the purpose of your life is to glorify God. Now, don't get me wrong. God is jealous over his people. God cares about his people. God desires our welfare. He desires that we're in. But really, when it all comes down to it, God's glory is the end of it. That's why whenever we sing, we sing to God's glory. Whenever we preach, we preach to God's glory. Because if, if anything else, we'd be stealing from what would be God's desired end. God desires to bless those who are obedient, but our chief end is to glorify him. Remember last week in verse 17, the last half of the verse, he said, why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? And we talked about Moses and how Moses appealed on behalf uh, of God for the people. In other words, God is saying, why should I be judging you? Why should all of these ha things happen? Because the nations who don't know you, they won't understand your sin. It'll be a reflection on me. They'll say, 
God isn't power enough to, powerful enough to deliver them. Notice what it says here. You'll have plenty to eat and be satisfied. There's a period there, but there's another sentence. You will praise the name of the Lord your God. In other words, God will be glorified. My people will never again be put to shame. You know that I am present in Israel and that I am the Lord your God. And then what does he add to it? There is no other. In other words, when God is doing this, God is glorified. When we repent and we walk in obedience with God, we're blessed. We have God's favor in that. But that favor is not an end in itself. God is glorified. That's why when you see someone who used to walk with the devil and, and, and they are radically transformed by the, by the gospel of Jesus Christ and you look and say only God could do it. But do you realize even for a child, only God can do it. Every salvation is a miracle. As we look at the plant and animal world described here, we see freshness and fruitfulness. Freshness, uh, renewed energy, and fruitfulness. And I thought about that. Those two parts of God's created order receive the blessing. But what about us as human beings, when we repent and obey, we walk in his favor and we have a freshness of spirit, which does what? Bears fruit unto him, just like God desired from that vineyard in Isaiah chapter five. So as we close today, I think it's important that we evaluate our lives. Are we walking in obedience uh, with the Lord? Are we enjoying God's favor. Every one of us should desire to have the golden scepter of the Lord, that, that God could, who sees everything, can look at our life and grant us favor. You know, when Esther approached Ahasuerus, the emperor, there was a lot of fear in it. There was a lot of prayer that went before because if she were rejected, she could die. But when she saw that golden scepter, in fact, it tells us in the book of Esther that it allowed the person to live. And so when God grants us his favor, it's a, pure, it's, it's a picture of freshness and life and fruitfulness. I wonder today, have you ever come to the point in your life where you've trusted Jesus Christ? That song that Bob sang is so true. Uh, every one of us, we have a sinful nature and unless we repent and trust in Jesus Christ, we're headed toward that judgment. But God in his grace, sent his son Jesus Christ to pay the price for us that we couldn't pay, that if we would repent and believe, we would be issued the golden scepter. We would move from the fear of death and the reality of death, spiritual death, to life. If you've never done that, why not today? Why not stand up and say, I want to identify with Jesus Christ. Maybe today you're a believer. Are you walking in God's favor or are you walking in disobedience? And can you look back a time in your life and you're saying, man, I remember how God was working and I don't sense it now. Maybe something you're neglecting to do in your life, something you've done in your life that's hindering that fellowship and fruitfulness. Why don't you have that favor restored to you today? I'm not talking about you'll, you'll repent and, and get back right with God and God will give you a million dollars. I don't see that in the scripture, but he'll give you his favor. He'll protect you. He'll provide. Let's trust him. Father, we come to you in prayer today.